Mary. Good morning, church. Good to see all of you this morning. My name is Mark. I'm one of the elders here at Missio. Um, and I'm just happy to be able to bring the word of, uh, word of God to you today. I invite you to turn to jo- uh, Joshua chapter 23, if you have a Bible uh, or a phone that you can look it up on. And uh, if you need a Bible, we do have some in the back. Uh, that you can just take and keep if you need a Bible for yourself. We would love nothing more than to have to buy more Bibles because that means these Bibles are being taken and and, uh, hopefully used. Um, You can also go on the info hub, info.mdcashville.org and click on the Today tab and you'll see the text for today's message there as well. Joshua 23, we're wrapping up, we're getting near the end of our series on Joshua. Have you enjoyed delving into this Old Testament history? I know in our community group, we've just really enjoyed asking the questions and and getting into some of the lessons that that God has for us as we learn a little bit about not only the history of, of the nation of Israel, but what became and becomes for us redemptive history as God works and moves uh, uh, eventually leading up to the, the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, and, and we've been able to look forward to that. Well, uh, I'm going to pray, and then we'll, um, we'll kind of break this down into two sections. We'll read it um, piece by piece. Uh, so let's pray, and then, then we'll dive in, all right? Father, we thank you for this day and this chance to be in your word. Lord, I thank you for each person who is here. I believe you have sovereignly sent them to this place. And Lord, may they hear what they need to hear today. May I hear what I need to hear today. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. All right. So Joshua 23. Now the setting here is a couple of weeks ago we wrapped up uh, chapter 21. And that was where it was described that the Lord had given them rest in the land, in the book of Joshua, as, as you know by now, they've been conquering the land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They've been conquering the land that God has promised to them. And uh, roughly seven years of time have, has passed and God finally gave them the land and gave them rest. And now, uh, chapter 22, which Brian talked about last week, 23 today, 24 next week, These are some uh, incidents that happened um, after this. And and so it gives us a little bit of a clearer picture. So I want to read verses 1 through 5, and uh, we'll get a little bit of the context of of, uh, what is happening today. Chapter 23, starting in verse 1. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years... Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight, and you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Now, here's the setting. In verse 1, it indicates that the Lord had given them rest from all their surrounding enemies. So we're in that time frame. The conquest has happened. They could even say to a degree that the job was done. And then uh, Joshua, it says, was old. And he even says that in verse 2. I am now old. Uh, Verse 14, he he reiterates it. um, We won't cover that today, but uh, you can look down. He says, now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. I I love that expression. Uh, It sounds so... I don't know, Old Testament. Uh, I'm going the way of all the earth. And, and just as an aside, we all will go that way. Whether you're old or young, that day is coming. 
So uh, Joshua is old, and uh, he gathers all of Israel, verse 2, and it says his elders, the heads. He gathers the leaders of Israel so that he can impart to them some final words. Now, final words are important in the Bible. We have recorded throughout the Old Testament the final words of, of uh, um, uh, Jacob, the, the patriarch, uh, as he talked to his 12 sons that became the, the 12 tribes of Israel. We have, um, we have the last words and the final words of, of Moses. Later on, we can read the, the final words of David as he passes on the kingdom to his son uh, Solomon. And most importantly, as we covered in a, in a message series last year, we have the final words of Jesus as he hung on the cross. And you, you may be familiar with the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross and what they, what they taught us. And they were important words. And that's what's going to happen here. And as Joshua is old and about to go the way of all the earth, he's, he's, he's understanding, I'm about to die. And now this new generation needs to carry on. What is he going to say to these leaders as they take up the mantle that Joshua will be giving them? Now, by the way, um, just as an aside, I want to make, make sure that, that don't think that because I'm the oldest elder in this church that I was given this passage of <laughs> Joshua being old and ancient of days. Um, I chose this passage, okay? Um, and and uh, um, I'm not the, the resident spokesman on being old here. I'm just saying, okay? Um, I can still rock and roll. And uh, you, you all only hope to be as cool as me when you're 64. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, verses two and three, um, as Joshua begins to speak, Notice what he says. He says, I am old now. You have seen, verse 3. I'm old, but you have seen. And in verses 3 and 4, uh, or rather in verse 3, he, says, he tells them what they have seen. He reminds them of what they have witnessed that the Lord has done. And some of the people that he's talking to were children at the time that God led the people out of Egypt 40 some years earlier. They crossed the Red Sea. Now their parents had all gone the way of all the earth in rebellion to God in the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, but some of these children were now older and they have seen all of this. Some of these were firstborn sons who watched the plagues when the firstborn were killed in Egypt and they were spared because of the Passover lamb. We have, we have lights doing strange things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we're good. <laughs> All right. So Joshua reminds them of all the things that they have seen that the Lord has done. And to summarize it, at the end of verse 3, he said, It is the Lord your God who has fought for you. So he's making them aware of and, and reminding them, this is what God has done for you. This is what the Lord has done. He has fought for you. This uh, phrase is repeated in verse 10. We'll get to that later in the present tense. It is the Lord who fights for you. But the promise stands. Now there are still nations that remain, verse 4. So not all the nations had been eradicated and not all the, the, the peoples of the land had been brought into subjection. So there are still nations that, that remain, but God still promises in verse 5, uh, Joshua says, the Lord your God will push them back and you shall possess their land just as the Lord has promised. So this is the setting. This is, this is where we're at as Joshua begins then to exhort these leaders 
and tell them how they can preserve this work of God. Because that's important. Joshua is about to die. And if the work that God has done dies with Joshua, that ends up meaning that it's not God's work at all. That it was Joshua's work and it dies with him. But Joshua wants to make sure that they continue God's work and they see what God has been doing remain and maintain. So he gives three exhortations in the next few verses on how to preserve the work. And so we're going to see these, we're going to dive into these uh, and uh, unpack it for us. So let's read starting in verse 6 through 11. Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Be, there, be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. So in this exhortation... Joshua gives three instructions. The first, he instructs them to complete compliance. Complete compliance. Verse 6. Therefore be very strong to keep and to do all that is commanded, all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Complete compliance. Keep the word. Obey the word. And he says, he further says, turning aside from it, neither to the right hand nor to the left. So what he's saying here is, keep on keeping the law. Don't drift. Don't drift off to the right or to the left. Keep the word. Now how would this drift happen? Well, he indicates this um, in verse 7. He says that you may not mix with these nations that remain. And then he has a, uh, a series of verbs that give us a, an increasing degree of compromise. Where he says, making mention of them, uh, making mention of the names of their gods, swearing by them serving them or bowing down to them. There's an ascending degree of compromise as you go through those, those words. So even to the point of just making mention of these false gods becomes a slight drift off to the right or to the left. And that slight drift leads to an even greater drift of swearing by these gods. And then as you swear by them, you begin to serve them. And then finally you reject Yahweh, the one true God, and you bow down to these other gods. Some of these men and women had seen this happen in the life of their parents and the generation before as they made golden calves and they worshiped the golden calf. So Joshua is saying, don't do that. Don't fall into the, the same mistake that your parents made of of following after other gods, but it starts by a slight movement to the right or left. It's, not, it's, it's usually not this all of a sudden just a turn and, and I'm going to reject the Lord and move on to my own way, follow something else. It's usually subtle and incremental over time. Now, just as there were nations that remained in the land for them, in the same way we as the church in this world, we remain among the nations, as it were. We remain, 
Jesus said, I, I don't say to take them out of the world, but they are in the world. I pray that they not become of the world. So we are here as believers in the world and we will interact with the nation, so to speak. We will interact with people who don't share our faith, who don't share our worldview, who don't share the love for Jesus Christ and, and have not received the grace that, that is found in, in him. And the answer to that has never been to remove yourself. Rather, it is to be strong among the nations. So, it is possible for us to compromise as well as we go through our life. And so we need to be encouraged to, to have that same complete compliance that Joshua is urging upon his people here. Well, we compromise when we find our ultimate delight and affections in things other than Christ. Now, it's okay to enjoy life, to enjoy the things that God has given you, your, your spouse, your family, your friends, the material blessings that we have here. It's okay to enjoy those, but it's not okay to make a God out of those and to make those things the most important and ultimate delight. And this is the mixing that Joshua warns us about here. A writer by the name of Daniel Hitchin said this, idol worship is as much a temptation for the modern Christian as it was for the ancient world. We may not have pagan altars in the hills, but we certainly have them in our hearts. And if we're not careful, there's a tendency for us to drift. Now this language here where he says don't drift either to the right or to the left, it really pictures for me kind of a narrow focus, a singular focus. And we need to be careful that we don't stray either one way or another. And as we've seen, even a little drifting, oh, just a little bit, is not okay. Little by little, we allow idols into our lives. We first begin to make mention of them and talk of them. Pretty soon that's all we're talking about. Then we swear by them. We say, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. This is so good for us. It's so good for me. It would be good for you and we swear by it. We begin to serve these idols by spending our time and investing our money and, and, and things like that into things other than God and his, his kingdom. And eventually we begin to bow down to these idols. Let me see if I can give it an, an example of how it might happen. Um, when I was younger, I love, well, and I still love basketball. I'm just not very good at it but I used to love to play basketball all the time and uh, to go and watch basketball games and when I wasn't watching or playing I was talking about basketball so I, here's how it can work in that in something like this you like basketball you love it you play it and then pretty soon it's all you think about it's all you talk about then you begin to say this is, you swear by it. You say, this is where I can find my fulfillment. This is where I can find my, my pleasure and my, my ultimate purpose. And then you begin to serve it. And sometimes it's at the cost of other things. You may go on a travel team and be gone every weekend and start missing community with God's people. And you, you, you spend money to, to invest in this. And then pretty soon you're, you find yourself drifting away from God and serving basketball. Now it doesn't have to be basketball. You fill in the blank for what it is for you. Career, possessions, anything that gets in front of us and God is an idol. And to our detriment, we tolerate these subtle drifts 
And pretty soon we find ourselves drifting even further away. We allow little sins to go unchecked. Well, that's just a little sin. As long as I'm conquering in the big areas, I'm not too worried about these little sins. I read a quote recently that said, Satan is more than happy to allow you victory over pornography if he can get you with pride. And we don't think about things like pride and gossip and some of the other respectable sins that nobody really notices, but they, they happen in our heart. We tolerate these things in our lives, and that's to our detriment. My friends, there are no little sins. Every sin is an affront against God. It's saying, I know better than you, God, of how to run my life. Therefore, this strong urge that we feel to, to worldliness and towards sin in our life, the temptation you face, that, that's a powerful influence on you. It must be met with strength. Our theme here is be strong and courageous. And we need uh, notice uh, in verse 6 that his, um, his command is not keep and do the word. It's be very strong to keep and do the word. We need to approach this with a sense of urgency and with a sense of this is life and death. This is not some little thing that we are working on or struggling with. This is all out war. And God calls us to be very strong in complete compliance to his word. Stop toying with temptation and with sin as if a little bit doesn't hurt. Now, if all this sounds too real, it's because I've talked this way to myself. Oh, it's no big deal. I have victory over this big thing, but this little thing, that's not that, I'm okay. So dangerous for us to think this way. So how? How do we become strong and courageous in our fight against sin? Well, it, it's not from trying harder. If you're sitting here now and going, you know what, Mark's right, I need to really work on this, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to grit my teeth. It's not how it happens. It comes from being in union with Christ, and it comes from choosing a greater affection. Whatever it is that's luring you, there's, there's something to be chosen instead of that. And I will talk more about that later uh, as we get to the third point. So I'll come back to that um, in a little bit. But before we go on, let me just ask you to think about this. Where are you drifting in your life? Where are you starting to see signs of just letting things happen and drift happen. Against what sin do you need to go to war and become a, a battle-tested Christian who fights and makes war on sin? So his first ex uh, exhortation to us is, is to complete compliance. The second is devoted dependence, verse 8. Devoted dependence. But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. You shall cling to him. And then Joshua reminds them of their past experiences again with God. In verses 9 and 10, he says, The Lord has driven them out. As for you, no man has been able to stand against you. One of you has sent to flight a thousand. Why? Because it is the Lord who fights for you. So we're back to that reminding them of, of what God has done for them. And 
on the basis of that, he's saying, now cling to him. Keep on, as you've done before, as you've done to this day, keep on clinging to the Lord your God. This is the dependence that we need to have towards God. We've talked about this with several of the messages. Israel is being reminded here, what happened when you depended on God? You won. You won all of these battles. 13 battles in the, in the book of Joshua. They were 12 and 1. And the one time that they lost, well, they got a rematch and, and beat them. But the one time that they lost, remember, that was after the first battle, Jericho. Very remarkable, very miraculous, clearly in their eyes that God did this. They didn't really do anything to knock down those walls, but God knocked them down and they, they conquered Jericho. So then they decide to go up against the city of Ai without even consulting the Lord as to whether that's the next step, but they did it anyway. And they sent spies and the spies come back and I'll remind you what they said uh, in uh, chapter 7, verse 3. They said, do not have all the people go up, but let uh, about two or 3,000 men go up and attack I. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. In other words, their mentality was, we don't need. We got this. We don't need. And that was, a, that was the point of our message in that in that text. Instead of relying on God, instead of clinging to God, they, they came from a, a position in their minds of strength. And ultimately they felt they didn't need God. So fast forward. Now they have rest. Now they've conquered these nations. And there's some that remain, but no reason to think that it wouldn't continue the way it, the way it has been. We'll keep this winning streak going. And it would be real easy now to think that dependence on God seems optional. We needed God to, to beat these nations, to conquer. But now that we're here, we got this, God. We're okay. And Joshua is reminding them, no. No, cling, keep on clinging. They needed God to obtain the peace. But the question is, will they continue to, maintain, uh, continue to need him to maintain the peace? This is the question Joshua is asking. And it's a question that we must ask. Every night I, I walk the dogs at my house, and sometimes I take them up behind my house into the woods behind us. And occasionally, my four-year-old granddaughter, Clark, wants to come along. And, and uh, that entire walk, she never stops talking. <laughs> and it just goes, you know. Um, and invariably, if she walks with me, she, she asks if we can go down this side path because it, it goes down to a, a fence and a gate and then we can look out over the valley, over the, um, the French Broad River Valley and we get a clear view of the Duke Power Station on Long Shoals Road um, and all the farmland and stuff in between. She thinks that looks like a lighthouse from about five miles. And okay, the lighthouse. Now, the end of that path is pretty steep, and it's, it's kind of uneven. There's been some erosion. So when we get there, she takes a hold of my hand, and I love it. Because there are a lot of times where she's not really interested. You know, do you want to you give Grandpa a hug? No. Go tell Grandpa goodnight, and she'll come in. She does this thing where, you know, she'll come in to give me a hug, but then right as she gets to me, she sort of turns. <laughs> and then I wrap around and hug her. And, and, but on that path, she holds my hand. 
And I love that because I love having her close and I love to have her depending on me. And in the same way, I, I love how that's a reminder of my relationship with my heavenly father. And in those times where I know that I need him, I grasp on really hard. But as soon as the path evens out, it's not so steep, don't we all have a tendency to, to let go? Okay, I got this, thanks. Thanks, Jesus, for getting me through this, but I'm okay now. And Joshua is saying, keep clinging to the Lord your God just as you've done in the past. Now that you've conquered the land, now that it seems like you don't need God as much, you need him all the more now. Because as he said, it's so easy to drift. So keep clinging. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, said, Oh, to be little in our own eyes. This leads to a continual dependence on the Lord Jesus. To be little in our own eyes. How do you nurture this dependence? Sometimes you're going to have times of, of real need, and then it's easy. You call on God, you pray hard, you, you get with him, you get with his people, you seek his face, you seek counsel. But when things are going well, when the land has been conquered, how do you then develop this dependence? Well, there are two ways. One is you remind yourself, as Joshua did here, of what happens when you do do depend on God, how God works as you are relying on him and clinging to him. But the other is to develop and embrace humility. Embrace your need, even in those times where it doesn't seem like you need it as much. So do you need to pray this prayer today? Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. That's such a great song, but it's a great, greater prayer. And I don't know where you're at today. You may be in one of those valleys where it's quite obvious that you need God. But you might be in a season where not so much. You need God then as well. Okay. So number three, the third exhortation for, for us is attentive affection. And that's in verse 11 where he says, Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Joshua ends his call with the one instruction that's going to make the other two possible. If you want to increase your obedience and your dependence on God, you need to increase your love for God. So, this is the great passion of your life, the great affection that we have, the pearl of great price for which we sell everything. The first and greatest commandment to love the Lord your God. The first love that dims all others. Love the Lord your God. Make that your passion. Make that your, your desire. Now notice the wording here. I, I find this also very interesting. He says, be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Take care in this. Be very careful. Again, it's not just a straight command. Uh, uh, number three, love God. No, it's be very careful to love. And I think the reason for this is it's very easy for us to fall into kind of a transactional relationship with God where we just start to think, well, he saved me. I obey him. 
I pray to him. He answers me sometimes. Rinse and repeat. And our obedience becomes rote and mechanical. You can obey God and not love God. The Pharisees were great at that in Jesus' time. They obeyed down to the every last little piece and they tithed from their spices. You know, every little thing that they received, they tithed a tenth and, and all of this. But they didn't love God. You can obey and not love God, but you cannot love and not obey him. So the love needs to come first. The love needs to be the primary force in your life. So we are called to nurture a heartfelt affection for God and a passion for Jesus Christ that will fuel our obedience and our dependence. Now how does that happen? So our first two points, we talked about obedience and dependence or clinging. How does love for God fuel those other two? Well, first the dependence. <coughs> Excuse me. You naturally cling to what is most precious to you. So if you want to increase your, your dependence on God and you're clinging to him, you must, you must make him more precious you seek for him, you thirst for him, your soul longs for him and yearns for him as the deer pants for the water. So my soul longs for you, O oh God. We foster this love for God and he becomes precious to us and thereby we then cling more to him because he is precious to us. How does this love fuel our obedience? Now this is where I said I would circle back around. As you fight against sin and temptation, the reason sin is so tempting is because it's, you know, feels good and, and there's, a, there's a payoff. That's nothing new, okay? We all, we all understand this. So as we, as we are told to, for example, in 1 John, which we studied uh, last year, love not the world, okay, I have a love for the world and the things of the world. Now I need to stop loving the world and the things of the world. How am I going to do that? Well, I, I can't just stop and try harder and stop loving the world. I have to seek a greater love to, to come in and take that place. There is a superior af uh, affection that I need to have in order to not have the affection for the world and its lure loses its sting, its lure loses its power over me. So your love fuels obedience by giving you a greater affection so that you pursue that and not the sin, not the thing that is so tempting to you but yet so destructive. Does that make sense? Okay. What is it that's tempting you? Find a greater affection. Find a superior pursuit. And that only will happen as you pursue and love Jesus Christ as your first love. Now, how, do we, how can we nurture this love for God? There's a story in Jesus' life. You can write this down and maybe read it later uh, in Luke chapter 7. Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee by the name of Simon. And while they're reclining at meal, a woman comes in with costly perfume and begins to clean and wash Jesus' feet, weeping and anointing his feet with oil and perfume and drying it off with, 
with her hair. And to Simon, this was abhorrent. Why are you letting her do this? And Jesus says, Simon, I've got something to tell you. Okay? So Jesus tells the story of a, a, a man who had two debtors. Two men who owed him money. One a great amount and one a, le- a smaller amount. But neither could pay their debt. And the man forgives the debt of both. And Jesus says, now, Simon, which of these do you think will love the man more? And he says, well, I suppose it's the one with the greater debt. And Jesus says, you've spoken truly. And then he, he points to the woman and he says, you see her? And his word is, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little now Jesus is not saying okay she's forgiven because she loved a lot it's more the point of she loves a lot she loves much because she knows she has been forgiven of much now let's be real I don't care how sanitary your life was before Christ we were all forgiven of a great debt beyond paying whether you had a a rough life before Christ on, in, in the eyes of the world, whether you were um, a, a criminal and, and, or whether you were a good church boy like I was, the death that Jesus paid for my sin and your sin was enormous. And I couldn't pay it. And you can't pay it. And the point of Jesus' story here is, Simon, your problem is not that... that you only have a little bit of sin. Your problem is you don't see how great your sin was. She knows what she's been forgiven of. She knows what has brought her to this point and and what God has, what debt God has paid and therefore she loves much. You only love a little because you don't get it. So, if you want to increase your love for Christ, you need to begin thinking more about just how large your sin debt was and how great and costly the price was to pay that debt. We just have this tendency to to think, yeah, I'm forgiven. Do you realize how much love God has for you to pay that debt through his only son. And so if you want to increase this love and this affection for God, dwell on and and think deeply of your sin and then think even deeper of how great his redemption and his forgiveness is. Do you love him much? He loves you with an everlasting love. And if your love has grown cold, then begin to dwell on just how deep that love, as we sing, how deep the Father's love for us. Now, as we finish up, what does it look like to finish strong? Here's Joshua near the end of his life and the nation of Israel at the end of the conquest, what would it look like to finish strong? And Joshua has told us it looks like complete compliance, devoted dependence, and attentive affection. It's obedience and dependence that flow out of that heartfelt love. This is an intentional approach to living out your faith. It's not just drifting or coasting along and just allowing things to happen. It's attacking sin where it dwells in your life and going on the, on the offensive and pushing them back and allowing the Lord to push them uh, back through you. 
Finishing strong finally looks like trusting in the one who will enable you to finish. Two weeks ago, Brian quoted Philippians 1.6. I'll say it again. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. That's the assurance we have. It is God who is fighting for us. So at the end of your days, when, you've, when you can say, I've finished strong, I've kept the faith, I've finished the race, the summary will be because it is God who has fought for me. I want to put some questions on the board uh, for you to think about, um, and then we'll uh, respond with communion and, and more worship and singing. All right, question one. Where is the temptation to drift strongest for you? Are you slipping into idolatry and tolerating sin? Now, if you're at that point in your life, you need to stop. You need to heed the warning and you need to, to return to the Lord. And as we said, it's not a matter of trying harder. It's, it's a matter of developing the love for him that will fuel that obedience. Question two, uh, when has depending on God been most evident in your life? Can you look back and say, yeah, right there, we were depending on him with a strong faith. Now, how can affirming his uh, provision, that should actually say his provision and your need keep you clinging to him? How can remembering his provision in the past and then being aware of your need keep you clinging? Number three, how can a greater understanding of your sin and the good news of the gospel grow your love and affection for Jesus? Knowing the gospel helps us love him more. Knowing the depth of our sin helps us to love him. And then number four, if our strength has failed, how can we in community encourage one another toward love and endurance in the faith? We can't do this alone. As you are in community, and Larry was talking about community groups, those ought to be groups where we are saying to one another, look, are you feeling like you can't keep on resisting this sin? Do you feel like you're drifting? Let me pray with you. Let me hold you up. Let me... Let me encourage you. Let me warn you. Come on back. Let me keep you praying, believing, trusting God. We're going to end uh, with our time of response that involves...